We're going to be looking at this very topic and the passage we're going to read in a moment. But when you start thinking of anxiousness, we start getting into the brain. We, we start getting into the sovereignty of God. We start getting into the mercy of God. We start thinking about grace. And we just need to recognize that um, we're walking into the ocean from the shoreline. Uh, researchers describe our understanding of the brain as equivalent to our understanding of the universe. We know a few things relatively well, but most of it is a bit of a mystery. Like the oceans, we've been able to kind of get the shoreline pretty well, but most of it is unexplored. And there's so much of it that we don't understand. And when it comes to anxiousness, and when it comes to the sovereignty of God in our experience, when it comes to our fear, we just have to admit how much we really do understand. We probably also need to let go of our compelling need to get our hands around it, or worse, claim that we've gotten our hands around it. The passage we're going to read in just a moment, though, is in some ways the, the passage through the Red Sea. Uh, we're entering into a, the chapter four of the book of Philippians, which is so, so, so practical. And what you have God doing is saying, you're not gonna all understand all of this and keep, keep learning, keep exploring, but until all things are made clear, here's what you need to know. So if you would, would you stand with me and we're gonna read chapter, uh, Roman, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 3 to 13. I'm sorry, 4 to 13. Oh, that's not it, but that's okay. Um, I'll read it for us. All right. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I, re I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm, I am in need, I have, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Thanks. You can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, we, uh, we live in anxious days. Uh, there are times in history and there's places in history where things are more stable, and there's times and places in history where things are less stable and maybe maybe even turbulent and compared to what we've known we're experiencing changes and because there's so many changes there's loss coming with these changes and there's unknowns that coming with come with these changes which makes these anxious days uh, and we're going to get to the specific word anxious um, and uh, we're not going to negate uh, really helpful medical or therapeutic answers. But today, we're going to talk about God's spiritual answer to our anxiousness. But <clears throat> I need to do something first. I, I need to ask you to stretch your faith uh, with something I'm going to call above and beyond outcomes. The passage I just read, and we're only going to look at the first four verses of it. Uh, it offers something uh, to you and to me that we don't believe. It offers something that, that's something that we might not 
believe as possible or might even accept as real. Every single one of us might have a certain level of what, of what we might accept as far as what is true. What I'm asking you to do is to, to believe it a bit higher, okay? So uh, there's two specific outcomes in the portion that we're looking at that are better than you think and are more possible than you can imagine. The first one is this. He says this, he says, rejoice in the Lord always, I'll say it again, rejoice. And then he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. I don't know if you've had an experience like this recently, if someone's ever come, come up to you and said, dude, you're like, you're like really gentle. <laughs> or, like, or maybe uh, someone came up to you like, woman, you are rocking gentleness today. You really are. Has, has, I don't think that's happened because I don't know if anybody would want that to happen to them. Anyway, but uh, uh, we have a, a, the word gentle feels relatively foreign from us. And even the translators struggled to, as to how they were going to translate this original Greek word. Uh, some of them translate, translates this, let your reasonableness be evident to all, or let your gentleness and graciousness be evident to all. Uh, what, what Paul is saying is that Philippians, and he's writing this letter to the Philippians, he's saying, you got to know that we're in anxious times and everybody's experiencing anxiousness. Uh, there, there's, there's, everybody's feeling difficulty. What you're experiencing can create in your community of people a gentleness that everybody could see and that everybody really could use to see. And gentleness, if, if you kind of go back to sort of understanding the basic idea of it, it's strength well used, right? Uh, when you think of the best definition of what a gentleman is, it's somebody who has strength but uses it gently. If you don't have the strength, you don't have it to use gently. Think of a ballerina in their perfection of, of their dance. It seems so easy and simple and so gentle, but make no mistake, there's an enormous amount of strength that enables that ballerina to stand on the tip of their toe. If you, like me, have never seen the ballet, you can, think, you can look at Joel Embiid, a basketball player. Seven foot two, 280 pounds, just an enormous amount of human, but can shoot a mid-range jumper just with Tremendous ease, strength, well used uh, for the good of others. And uh, the, the basic storyline of Christians is that they lust for power. This is the storyline in the world, you know, of folks who are really faithful, right? They're lusting for power. They're obsessed with conspiracy theories. And they really love to, to show everybody their anger. That's, and that's, the funny thing is that's not the Christians I see and those aren't the Christians I meet. But what I want us to believe is that it could be true of us as people describe the folks of 938 Church, and I think it is true, that our gentleness would be felt. Not weakness, not, you know, not uh, limpness or apathy, but strength expressed with care. One of my favorite things to see in someone's life is to see their graciousness, their reasonableness, their gentleness emerge as their faith grows. Uh, that, that's, that, that needed to happen with me. And, you know, I don't know what your experience of me is, but if, if, if you would have experienced me 25, 30 years ago, I was much more of a black and white thinker. I was, I was, con I was convinced of what I knew, and I had no awareness of what I didn't know. And I was... I, I was passionate about my hot takes. I had a lot of rough edges. Um, and, you know, when you're young, passion takes you far, but over time, God has had to round those edges off. And, and to this day, I'm still learning some reasonableness. I'm still learning uh, gentleness, and I'm learning graciousness. But that's what God does in our hearts. Over time, as we experience grace, we learn to extend grace. As we experience God's gentleness with us, we learn to extend that towards others. And it could be characteristic, not just of us, but of, of all Christians that, well, increasingly they seem to be a gentle people, a 
strong people. The second thing that I, the second above and beyond outcome that I want to ask you to try on and just believe more than you currently brought in, okay? Is that there's a peace that can transcend your understanding. Uh, the promise is, is if, we, if we can trust God, and we'll talk about this in a moment, but if we're able to step, walk through what he is guiding us in, the, what he says is this, the peace of God which transcends all understanding, the understanding that our medical profession has been able to get their hands around, uh, the therapists have been able to get around, hands around, um, uh, your high school football coach has been able to get his hands around. No, all understanding. The, there's a peace that transcends all understanding. You can experience this, and it could guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Uh, and my, my thought here is that you probably came in believing in maybe this amount of peace. I want you to try on the idea that God can give you a spiritual peace that's sourced in his Holy Spirit. Uh, therapists and, and counselors and friends in the community and, and, and doctors, all of them have their role. Uh, but what I want you to hope for, I, what I want us to hope for one another is to experience peace from the very source, from God himself. All right? This, this, in some ways, opens up our entire series. This series, as uh, Rachel shared with you, is called The Secret. And we're looking at Philippians chapter 4. And in some ways, I think one of the most practical parts of the Bible in, in, in any space. And in every, in every part of this, Paul's talking about the struggles of the Christian life and really the practical ways that we apply the gospel, the good news of what has happened in Jesus and how we apply it into our lives to realize that grace in our everyday life. And he, said, he says, I've learned this secret. Paul says, I've learned the secret as to how to be content in all things. Now, um, that's why we're calling the, the series The Secret. There's two problems with The Secret, okay? So we're going to get this out of the way first of all. Uh, when he says... The passage says this, I've learned the, cons the secret to be content in all things. The next thing Paul says is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which is an amazing verse, but it's also probably the most poorly applied verse in all of history. How many, how many quarterbacks have set after the Super Bowl have quoted that verse regarding their victory, even though the other quarterback on the other team was also quoting that verse? Uh, you, you might remember uh, a, a long while ago, Evander Holyfield was a, uh, a heavyweight fighter, and he could do, he, he had on the back of his robe, I can do all things, right? And that was awesome, particularly when he, he beat the heck out of Mike Tyson, right? Uh, and sure, certainly enough, at least in his mind, God gave him the strength to beat to a pulp another man. Uh, and then when he came out uh, for his next fight against Lennox Lewis, he had the same thing on his, on his back, but for some reason, God didn't give him the strength to beat him up because the other guy beat him up that day. So God, you know, so he, he's, he can do most things through Christ who strengthens him. Uh, uh, maybe that's not exactly what God was thinking. Maybe that's a little bit more mysterious the other problem we have with the word contentment is the truth of the matter is, I don't like it. I actually like, if, if, if I just said, hey, all of you be content. There's something in you, if, if you're like me, there might be something in you that's like, wait a second, we shouldn't be content. Or should we? Uh, I started feeling this, a need to kind of look at this a little more closely, probably about 10, 12 years ago. And I came across this Puritan book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. And it's like, it, it, writes, like, it, it writes like a Puritan book, uh, and it looks like a Puritan book, uh, but it had tremendous depths of wisdom. 
I just want to share one quote in it. It said, it may be said of one who is contented in a Christian way that he's the most contented man in the world and the most unsatisfied man in the world. In his Puritan way, he says, these two must needs be mysterious. You never learn the mystery of contentment unless it may be said of you, just as you are the most contented man, so are you the most unsatisfied man in the world. I'm not going to explain that, but I do want to invite us into the mystery of our faith around certain things. There's, there is unbelievable peace for us to walk with in our faith. If we'll allow there to be enough mystery about what we do know and what we don't know, and if we will trust what God has specifically revealed us to know and to do, there's a lot of goodness, peace, ambition, and contentment that can be available to us. So today, specifically to move us into that mystery, where there's going to be four weeks of teaching around this very topic. Today, I want to talk about a, a core commitment and a simple practice. All right? Here's the core commitment. The Christian is committed to joy. The passage begins with Paul uh, coming to the Philippians and saying to the Philippians, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He repeats it because we disregard him the first time. We don't actually listen to it. And, and, and I would say most Americans hear that and say, oh, that's nice. You rejoice. That's good. We should do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But no. But he's like, he's really serious. In fact, if you're reading through the book of Philippians, this is the 10th time he has re, he's used the word rejoice or the word joy because it's a serious deal. We tend to underestimate what it's really about. We're like, well, isn't life about what I'm, what, about my mission, what I'm supposed to be doing, what I'm supposed to be accomplishing, and this, that, the other? And I think Paul's like, actually, that's like a sub-theme. The bigger aspect of your life is, what are you really going to enjoy? Like, what will be your joy? Like, what will, what will you really choose to enjoy in this life? Because that which you choose to enjoy will drive everything else. The Westminster Confession of Faith says, the chief end of man is to glorify God. Yeah, that sounds, that makes sense, to glorify God. And enjoy him forever. Now, uh, enjoying God sounds like, well, how do you kind of do that, right? Is, like, is there a channel on the TV that I can just go enjoy him, right? Um, like, how do you enjoy him? Well, that's a bit of the art of life. It's the bit of the mystery of life that God invites us into. And Paul wants to kind of like drive it into our minds that like the Christian must be committed to being joyful. What he's not saying is this. What he's not saying is that um, act like you're happy all the time. And he's not saying be happy all the time. And he's not saying if you're a Christian, that means you should have a naturally sunshiny personality. He's not saying those things. He, what he, he's pointing to something a bit deeper. That regardless of what's going on in your life, there, there can be a joy that permeates no matter what you suffer. No matter what's going on around you, you can be tapped into a stream from God that, that flows with joy and shows up everywhere in your life. A couple of things God particularly, specifically invites us to is to a habit of joy. Uh, part of worshiping together is we come together to celebrate. We're, when we're together and we, we sing a song and we have food, this is, this is um, it's, it's a Bible word, so we don't use it very well. This is rejoicing. This is celebrating. This is enjoying. This is enjoying God. This is enjoying all that he's doing. Uh, worship is 
uh, is, is focusing, on, focusing ourselves on the 99.9% .9 of things that are right in the world all the time. You know how many breaths you've taken today? You know how much the, how the plants continue to recycle out the CO2 and return to us oxygen? The sun came up. There seems to be enough water because the weeds are growing in my garden, right? There seems to be just enough water. There's, there's definitely, at least for me recently, there's been plenty of food. Uh, there are so many things that are going right. And the Christian is committed to booting themselves on all that's right with this world and, and letting go of the obsessions with what might be wrong with the world. The Sabbath is given for you to have a specific day of the week just to enjoy the work that has been done. Just to enjoy the work that's been done. Six days you work, enjoy it now. Rest and celebrate in the one who created all of these things. One of the things that made the pandemic so difficult was our inability to be together to celebrate. Paul, Paul would speak regularly when it comes to joy. And, and we'll talk about love when it comes to our faith. And we'll talk about uh, God's grace when it comes to our faith. But celebration even goes beyond that to the very glory of God. Recognizing that there's even, even something bigger and more majestic that we can get our hands around. Paul would say, I consider our present sufferings not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. He's talking about this joy that he's tapping into. When we come together and worship, we, 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 we recognize that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has conceived of the glorious things that God has prepared for those like you who loves him. We come in and we celebrate that there's a majestic plan at play. And God has a plan for you. For you. God has a plan for you that no eye can see it. No ear could hear. No mind's ever going to be able to conceive of the plan God has for you. And we celebrate that. We rest in that. We enjoy that. We, we can all, no matter what church you go to, if your church is of 25,000 people and you're meeting in a, or an arena or stadium or wherever you go, every single one of us could get better production value and a better communicator online. You can find somebody who's going to say exactly what you want to hear. You can get unbelievable musical clarity with your Bose headphones. But Paul invites, us, invites and calls the church to rejoice and to continue to rejoice, to be a people of rejoicing, which means embodied people. One of the most beautiful parts of being a part of a church, in my mind, is that on my worst day, and you know, and it's hard for me to, to declare something as wonderful or praiseworthy while in this room, uh, there's somebody who's having a really good day, and they can sing that way. And on my days where I can sing that with, with full vigor because I'm feeling it, I also know that as I'm singing that, I'm singing for that, I'm singing for that person who can't sing it. And together we become a rejoicing body. Together we rejoice with those who rejoice. We can weep with those who rejoice. We want to weep with those who weep. But create a culture of people who are celebrating what is right with the world and continuing to move our hearts and minds towards that. That's the core commitment. The Christian is committed to doing whatever it takes to solve for genuine enjoyment. Uh, but that's why an anxiousness can be so defeating. Anxiousness can feel like, it can feel like that, not, not always, and I think, but in my experience, this can feel like a toggle switch from joy. I was doing real well, and then you brought that topic up, and, oh, and all of a sudden I feel this anxiousness. This passage gives us a, a, a simple practice that I believe will help each of us and all of us deal with anxiousness. He says this, 
he says, he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which I talked about earlier, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. How do we find that peace that transcends all understanding when we are anxious? It's a pretty simple practice that anybody can do. Um, first of all, I, you know, from a Bible perspective, the way I would define anxiousness, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm separating a little bit from anxiety. Anxiousness is just a, a physical manifestation of fear. And when we understand it rooted in fear, we can start, deal, the Bible opens up, because there's not a, lot of, not a lot of times in the Bible does you hear the word anxious. Uh, but all over the Bible, it talks about fear. In fact, like, everywhere it talks about fear. Like, all, all the time, everywhere, it just, you know, anytime an angel comes, he shows up and says, do not fear. Every time there's a new prophet, they say, do not fear, do not be afraid. It's one of the fundamental things that God wants for you and, and calls you to do is to not fear. Why? Because if God is for you, who could be against you? And he wants you to know that and feel that and believe that. And so that's why I keep saying it like a bazillion times, right? So he wants you to, to when it comes to fear, use every tool at your disposal, doctors, counselors, friends, therapists, but I want to talk to you specifically about how he wants you to address your fear with him personally. There's three words that this passage talks about. He talks about prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. Just with thanksgiving, you can talk to God about what you're anxious about. In some ways, that's, that's where it begins. Uh, but talk about it with thanksgiving. And what that means is when you come to God in prayer, begin by acknowledging what's right. Uh, acknowledge, you know, whether you're sitting down or you're kneeling down or whatever, begin with an acknowledgement of something that has gone right in your life or what is right with this world. When you do that, you start, under, you, you start seeing your life in context of God's care, God's activity, God's strength, God's provision for you. Because you need to understand, when it comes to our anxiousness, our anxiousness is telling us a story. It's a telling us a story that, A, God's not in control, that we have something to be genuinely afraid of, and Thanksgiving becomes a counter-narrative, that yes, there is this thing here, but there's a God bigger than it. All right, so we begin with Thanksgiving. Uh, the, the, uh, um, and, uh, and then secondly, we begin to pray about it. And I want to distinguish the, what, the difference between prayer and petition. Uh, <coughs> I believe when we think about prayer, we need to think about a conversation with God. And uh, what I have found and what I've learned from my mentors is that when I'm praying about anxiousness, I am beginning to name that fear in my experience to God. I'm saying, God, I'm feeling this. My body's tightening up. My chest is tightening up. And I don't even know why sometimes. And then I begin in conversation with God to do a very specific thing that God commanded people to do right from the beginning. Do you remember the first task that Adam was given in the garden? Adam and Eve were given the task of naming the animals. To sort of take that a massive blur of life or whatever and start sorting that out well that's the very thing that uh what we do in prayer when we start saying all right god i don't know what it is but i need you to help me understand this and as we pray about it in conversation what we're trying to do is to name the specific fear what that does is when you name the fear it separates it from you right because anxiousness feels like this thing that is you right? It, it, it feels consuming of you. It feels like it's shutting you down. It's the toggle switch on your joy, right? And it feels like it's consuming you. And the, and the other thing that, that happens with ang anxiousness is that it makes you fundamentally reactive. 
because when you're anxious, the one thing you want to do is to not feel it, right? And so there's a couple of things. Sometimes we, you know, we fight uh, from it, we flee from it, or we just freeze in it. But like whatever we want to do, we want to stop feeling it, and, and re- anxiousness will make us reactive. When we begin praying about it, what, what we are doing is we are grasping our identity as people who are made in the image of God, and we begin saying, this is not me, this is not from me, this is not a part of me, this is something that I am experiencing, and we separate the anxiousness from us and say, what is this? And as we start saying, God, what is this? We think about this and we start sorting out. We're trying to name it. Once we name it, then we could do something about it. Okay, I am afraid that I did something here and this person isn't going to like me or this person is going to reject me or this person is going to hurt me in some way. Okay, now I have something to ask God for, right? Uh, God, I need protection from this person. God, I need help to address this situation. I need more resources for this. But until we have prayed about it, until we've taken that thing that, is, that feels like it is us and separated it from us, we don't have anything to ask God for, okay? So now the important thing around this is this, is God will uh, give us the opportunity, God invites us to come straight to him with this. Uh, if you're like me along the way, sometimes you sit and you're like, all right, God, I'm anxious about this. And to pray about it just makes you more anxious. Uh, That's a really good sign that um, I'm too anxious to probably process it on my own. And the principle in this situation is that uh, when something is that big and that overwhelming, you need to put more light on it. The first thing I want to do is I want to bring it to God, bring it into his light. And and if I'm still too anxious, I need more light. That's when you bring another person in and you talk about it with that person, right? And then the two of you are trying to say, okay, there's this anxiousness, what is it, right? But sometimes it's too anxious for the two of you, right? Because then all of a sudden you guys are fighting and now it's one big thing, right? right? And so that's when you need to, that's at the point at which you need more light, right? You need more people praying it, more people processing it, right? Uh, oftentimes by the time anxiousness gets to the pastor's office, it's, it's just such, it, it has uh, taken hold to such a degree uh, that it, we oftentimes need more, more and more resources, and that's oftentimes where doctors can come in and help. And, uh, and this does not negate oftentimes maybe genetic or physiolo- physiological experiences that will, will take a normal fear and just put uh, extra charge to it, right? And that's, that's why we need a broader set of resources but the fundamental thing that all the doctors and all the therapists are, are trying to enable us to do is the simple practice of naming this fear, separating it from us so that we can make a petition. The petition is this, God, would you help me not be afraid of this situation? God, will you give me courage, right? Um, and, and friends, will you encourage me, will you keep me accountable that I have the courage to step into this dark situation that I think is really scary for me? The goal of this is that we might know know God and enable him to know us fully and to find our our contentment in him, a sense of satisfaction in him, a a joy in him as we walk into all the very, very challenging things in life. And we learn to trust him with scary things. Now, uh, I'm not going to say more because actually that this simple thing really is it. Uh, for me in my life, um, I, I, I have a, I've had a unique kind of experience about anxiousness. Most of my uh, you know, early adult years, I would say, well, I'm, I don't really experience fear or anxiousness about anything. Uh, and then, you know, at a certain point in time, I had to work with a counselor to deal with some family of origin issues and work through some, through some sense of counseling. And then I realized, oh, crud, I've, I've had anxiousness has been all the, in my life the entire way. I just didn't know it, and I didn't feel it because that was just normal, right? But along the way, I experienced a peace 
that I didn't even know existed beforehand. And I want you to believe in that kind of peace. And uh, I, 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 I've, I know how to lose that peace, but I, I've learned how to find my way and to grapple my way back into that peace. And I've learned that peace and anxiousness can be in the same heart at the same time. Peace and sadness can be in the same heart at the same time. Uh, peace and celebration and grief can be in the same heart at the same time. And there, yes, there is a peace that trans transcends the understanding of, of my own self. I don't understand where it's coming from sometimes. And it, it's not because I've got everything in line. In fact, uh, more and more, I, I feel like uh, in my, as I've matured, I more, become more and more convinced of how little control I have in this world. But it's never been attached to that control. And we can grow in this to where we have a greater sense of God's control, a greater experience of his peace. And a greater connection to him in all things. I, I just, the, if I can wrap it up with one last thing. I want you to see your anxiousness as an opportunity. For so much, for so much of my life, and I think this is just an American thing. It's like all right, I just want to get control of everything, right? So I don't need God. Um, anxiousness, I have found, is that dashboard light that says that's in my body where God's saying, "Hey, I'm here. I'm here." Here's one more thing you don't have to figure out on your own. Here's a thing where you can come closer to me and experience peace in this area. And I don't know how, you know, it's, you probably should think to yourself, how do I experience anxiousness? Is it, how does it show up in my body? For me, it's usually right here in the chest. Sometimes it's in the stomach. Sometimes it's even in the throat. How, how does your body manifest it? That's not something to be afraid of. Yes, it's a bad feeling. But I, when you have that feeling, I want to see, I want you to see it as an opportunity. An opportunity for you to bring that to the very God who loves you, who's been drawing you to himself, who's drawing you to his love, who's drawing you to his compassion, who has a glorious plan for you that no eye, no ear, no mind can conceive. He's got a wonderful plan, and he wants you to know the peace that comes specifically from him by his spirit.